to this committee because I, I, I can assure you that they will not be uncomfortable about uh, uh, um, Congresswoman Carter Collins forming an, a, a committee of distinguished citizens like these to talk about them. So we, we need to do less talking about how much we dislike or hate gangster rap, and we need to come up with some ways uh, in, in which to uh, control the antisocial things that are discussed on these records. Thank you very much. I thank you very much. This has been a good panel, and we have had a wide-ranging discussion uh, as the opening panel of this series of hearings that we're going to have. We're now going to proceed to our next hearing, and I thank each of you for appearing before us, especially those of you who have come from very far distances. And Mr. Battison, we understand that it took a lot for you to get here. We appreciate your coming. Our next panel will be coming forward, uh, Mr. Nelson George, who's a journalist, um, Mr. Ernie Singleton, President of Black Music Division, MCA Records, Mr. David Harleston, President of Ral Def Jam Recording, and Yo-Yo, uh, Recording Artist with the East-West Records. George, we're going to begin with you. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, it's a very great pleasure. I feel very honored to be here. Uh, my name is Nelson George. I was a black music editor at Billboard magazine from 1982 to 1989. I've written several books on the evolution of black hmm. popular music in the United States and worked in rap music in a number of contexts, including motion pictures and charitable organizations. In 1989, I, along with a number of other people in the record business, organized a, a group called the Stop the Violence Movement. There's a collective of rappers as well as uh, young people in the record industry 
who put out a record uh, video and a book uh, looking at black on black violence. And uh, in the course of that, we raised $300,000 for the National Urban League. So I've been very involved with rap and also its social side. Uh, I first became involved in rap music or aware of it in 1978 as a, a college student in New York City when tapes of rap music were being circulated along the streets of New York. Uh, I've seen it evolve from something that was for youth, basically South Bronx, as well as in Harlem. Uh, it's evolved into this multifaceted music that embraces everything from uh, jazz-oriented rap, Tribe Called Quest, middle-class rap, if you will, The Fresh Prince, uh, yo-yos, rap, which deals with feminist issues, all the way to basketball players like Shaquille O'Neal making rap records. Rap music is a very complicated form. It is not easy, even within one artist, it is not easy to say an artist is a gangster rapper or not a gangster rapper. In that case, I would cite Tupac, who's someone who's been vilified uh, and accused, which I think in the United States still means accused means not guilty until proven guilty, has been accused of several things, but on his own record. He uh, recorded a record called Keep Your Head Up, which has been this year, last year was an anthem in praise of black women. So within each artist, there are many different impulses, some of which may be positive, quote unquote, some of which may be negative, quote unquote. But to say that every artist, because they have one record or have one incident in their life that may be negative, to brand them with an overall stripe, I think is very dangerous. One of the things I want to talk about today, um, which I have not commented about very often in discussing this music, is music itself. The maker of the best known gangster rap records, namely Dr. Dre Andre Young of Los Angeles, California, a former member of NWA, now a solo artist and the producer of Snoop Doggy Dogg, has not been successful simply because he has spoken on CD of disrespecting women or of gangsterism. Uh, Dr. Dre is easily one of the top record producers in America today. His embrace of 70s funk and expert arrangements are crucial to the sales of his records. To ignore the essential pleasure, purely as a listening experience, that one takes from his music is to be ignorant of how music as a product is consumed by those who buy it. The music is always first. The sound of the singer or rapper's voice is second. The lyrics, if the listener ever learns all of the lyrics besides the hook, is usually the third element. Gangster rap often sells because it is musically superior to other forms of rap music or popular music. From the viewpoint of someone who's been following rap since his days in Harlem, I must say that I am proud of its overall development as both an innovative recorded music and as a vehicle for social commentary. That a handful of artists have sold millions of records about black genocide, and make no mistake about it, only a handful of records of artists have benefited in the millions from this style of music does not invalidate the art form, certainly. Moreover, to discuss the subset of rap music, gangster rap, outside the, the forces that influence it, from the Hollywood action movies of Joel Silver, to the consumerism of 80s TV shows like Dynasty, to the uh, uh, influx of AIDS in the black community, to teenage unemployment, to the availability of 12 millimeter machine guns and automatic weapons that are available by trucks in any black community in the United States, to 12 years of Republican government. To discuss gangster rap out of this context is to rip this music out of context and to endow its creators with the profound power that I don't believe they have. For me, the question of gangster rap's role in America is not a question of the chicken or the egg. The egg in this case is the economic and social breakdowns that have taunted our cities since at least the riots of the 1960s, and that, few, that shows few signs of really being addressed. The chicken is the culture of cynicism about government and verbal rebellion that rap represents. If tomorrow every offensive gangster rap record was removed from our stores, our airwaves, and our video shows, there would still be random violence, teenage unemployment, teen pregnancy, and drug trafficking. The only difference is that the musical backing for our youth would change, but the conditions that frighten our nation into congressional hearings on rap would continue. Um, just in conclusion, I'd just like to say that one of the things about rap that has made it appealing both to black teens and white teens around America is the fact that it is rebel music, and that part of its critique and part of its appeal is that it attacks things such as uh, the Congress of the United States, Christianity, one of the big sort of selling points, if you will, of, for a lot of artists about rap music is that it, it is anti, uh, anti almost most of the traditional values of the states. Uh, Public Enemy, part of their appeal, one of the most powerful groups in affecting rap music, is that it embraces the nation of Islam. Uh, and it has been a very important part of 
propagating the uh, influence of the Nation of Islam around the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the rappers in Los Angeles who become very prominent also are uh, devotees of the Nation of Islam. Thank you very much, Ch Madam Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Singleton. Good morning, Madam Chairman. It's very much an honor to be here and to be invited to speak on this issue. Um, to you, Madam Chairwoman, and the other members of the subcommittee, uh, first of all, I'd like to identify myself. My name is Ernie Singleton. I'm the president of the Black Music Division of MCA Records. Some of the acts on my label range from popular R&B artists such as Bobby Brown, Gladys Knight, Patti LaBelle, Jody Watley, New Edition, Belle Biff DeVoe, and also hip-hop acts to include the likes of Mary J. Blige, Rex and Effects, Jodeci, and Heavy D and the Boys, just to name a few. The American music industry is one of the most energetic and imaginative businesses in society, employing hundreds of thousands of talented artists, musicians, as well as marketing, promotion, publicity, business affairs, marketing, manufacturing, and distribution personnel, who produces recordings of remarkable diversity and remarkable depth. And while our industry has been allowed to flourish in an innovative and creative environment, we do not underestimate the significance and the importance of our social responsibilities and our role as good corporate citizens. Today I'm here to present to this committee my concerns, my personal views on this issue and the overview of the positive and important steps the recording industry has taken in its responsibility for explicit content of sound recordings, including those that contain explicit themes like some of the so-called gangster rap. In 1985, the Recording Industry Association of America reached an agreement with the National Parents and Teachers Association and the PMRC, or better known as the Parents Music Resource Center, the agreement specified that music releases containing explicit lyrics, including explicit depiction of violence, be identified so that parents can make intelligent listening choices for their children. In 1990, after communicating with parents, record companies, and retailers, we established through the RIAA a voluntary uniform parental advisory logo. That logo is placed on all of our recordings that are considered to be containing explicit lyrics. The standardized label was implemented to increase overall consumer awareness of the advisory sticker and specifically to provide parents with a single standardized and easily identifiable means of singling out records with explicit themes. Each record company in consultation with the artist determines which of these recordings will display that logo. If I may digress for a moment, Madam Chairman, I think you held up a CD that may not have been in accord with that, and that may be another issue totally separate and apart from the issue of the recording industry as a whole. The black and white logo shown, or the parental advisory logo, is, is standard in size and in color. It's also standard in placement and is affixed to the bottom right corner of an album, cassette, or CD. It's affixed to the permanent packaging. Um, underneath the cellophane shrink wrap. The label measures one by one half inch on cassettes and CD jewel boxes and one by one half inch on albums. Let me add that this logo is actually printed on the CD or cassette cover and cannot be removed. The parental advisory program supplemented by retailers cooperation is a positive response of the music industry and responsible corporate citizens to provide useful information to parents and guardians to assist them in deciding what their children should listen to. While I'm expressing my views as a record industry executive, I would also like to speak as a citizen and a father of three children between the ages of 16 and 23. I believe that the parental advisory logo, and for that matter, any labeling, is no substitute for responsible parenting. The morals and ethics of our society are slowly diminishing, and that, Madam Chairwoman, is what I think needs to be addressed and changed. We must look at societal problems like our welfare system that encourages dependence and not empowerment. Societal disintegration starts with factors like these, not the music. Rap, rap music, and music in general, but more specifically rap music, is like a storm. It will not diminish until the societal woes that these young men and women so eloquently express in their music are attended to. If you try to stop it, just like a storm, it'll take you with it. 
I think that no one here will disagree with me when I say that families with strong parental figures, quality education, caring communities, and real jobs is what's needed. These are some of the solutions to the problems of violence in our society. Ensuring the existence of those factors in the lives of young people involves some tough decisions at the governmental level and some tough decisions at the personal level. We can't simply abdicate our responsibilities as parents, legislators, or citizens by singling out a few TV programs, a few movies, or a few musical recordings. In closing, it would be fair to assume that there are some people in this room here today who have already made their decisions and drawn a conclusion about rap music and the artist. To those people, I ask that you open your minds and use today as an opportunity to take a closer look at the young people who are creating this music. These young men and women are passionate about what they feel. They are poetic. They are very innovative and creative in their expression. But if nothing else, at this meeting, you should be able to come away with an awareness of the fears and frustrations that they are so constantly expressing that is so deeply rooted in their spirits and in their lyrics. How can rap continually be blamed for the increased violence in our communities baffles me when the violence was here long before rap music and much longer than the gangster rap music has been here. Rap artists verbalize their reality. They do not celebrate that reality. Our children, who are these rap artists, are angry and they express their anger in their lyrics. Many of the young men and women who rap today are considered outsiders by the mainstream of American society. Their reality and their world is one full of poverty, violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, racism, homelessness, hopelessness, disrespect, just to name a few of the ills. They live in a world that few in this room, if many, could even survive in. I do not condone violence or the negative lyrics, but this is the reality of our, of our impoverished inner cities, and it's the reality of the American youth. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Mr. Harleston. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman. My name is David Harleston, and I'm president of Rush Associated Labels, or RAL, which has as its largest and most prolific division, Def Jam Recordings Incorporated. Def Jam Recordings, or Def Jam, was founded in 1983 by Russell Simmons, who has been widely recognized as the individual who brought hip hop to the cultural fore. Russell Simmons currently serves as our chief executive officer. RAL is engaged primarily in the creation, marketing, promotion, and distribution of the spectrum of music that is known as hip hop. In 1993, hip-hop music in all its forms accounted for approximately 7.8% of the estimated $10.2 billion of music in the United States. Without question, hip-hop has evolved into a major contributor to the music industry. This music and this culture have achieved a level of creative energy which justifies our corporate commitment to the genre. Hip-hop has provided an extraordinary avenue of artistic expression for African-American youth, and it has economically empowered a generation of artists, producers, and others who have imported hip-hop culture and music into areas such as fashion, film, advertising, comedy, television, and publishing. Madam Chairwoman, I would be less than candid if I did not acknowledge my concerns about this hearing. During the past year, the hip-hop community has been the subject of intense scrutiny concerning the role of rap music in our culture. Some critics have suggested, for example, that rap music glorifies violence, degrades women, and erodes community values. I do not question the sincerity of those who have expressed those views. However, I strongly believe that those views are myopic. Let's be clear. Like all artists, hip-hop artists are products of their environment. Their environments have influenced who they are and the kinds of music that they make. Accordingly, Hip-hop artists frequently relate experiences which many find unsettling or uncomfortable. That is precisely the point that certain artists are trying to make. However, it is increasingly apparent that certain opponents of hip-hop music are of the misguided view that if we do not hear about the issues raised and addressed in the music, then those issues will not exist. In fact, one could argue that efforts to suppress hip-hop artists are efforts to ignore unpleasant realities that exist in America's backyard. Such a view simply denies reality. Silencing the messenger will not extinguish the problem. 
While I am here today to discuss hip hop culture and the recording industry, I hope that we can also begin a constructive conversation about the conditions to which some members of our society are subjected. Conditions which, in fact, make gangsterism appear to be a reasonable life choice. As a record company, Def Jam is essentially a manufacturer, marketer, promoter, and distributor of recorded music to consumers. Fundamentally, we discover, develop, and sell music. In so doing, we work closely with artists, managers, and producers, all of whom have a direct and immediate interest in the success of a particular recording. When we make a decision to sign an artist, that decision fully embraces the artist's vision. Our primary inquiry is whether the artist is authentic and distinctive. In our view, the dominant concern is that an artist write and rap from, an important, ex from important experiences in that artist's life. Those experiences may not be pretty or pleasant. They need only be real. It is for these reasons, therefore, that we do not require an artist to adhere to prescribed, prescribed rules relating to lyrical content. Rather, in deciding whether, in our judgment, the work of a particular artist is of sufficient merit to warrant release, we ask only whether the work is true Let's to the artist. This vision. young lady boss, Lachelle Laws, I understand is her name. And the article says, is entitled, How a Nice Middle Class Girl Evolved into a Gangster Rapper. And the article, in this article, she describes how she was not able to get a recording contract until she started doing gangster rap. Now, how is it that a company that prides itself in promoting authentic voices could have, you know, um, as I understand it, she, she uh, is on your label, is that right? Yes, Boss is um, uh, on DJ West, which is so one of our West Coast So how could label. this have happened? Well, first, if I could address the, the, the factual inaccuracies both in that article and, okay. and in the prior panel. Um, when Boss was signed to us, Boss was Boss. That is to say, Boss is what what she is now. So you uh, didn't change her. You absolutely no not. Purposes. And as a as a factual matter, we have never um, even attempted to do that with with any artist. I I, I suspect every other record company is the same. Um, Lachelle Laws, professionally known as Boss, um, is an extremely exciting artist who made the decision um, when we became aware of her. Uh, to create a character, to create a persona that she thought reflected um, a, a sentiment, um, a theme, a feeling among a whole host of women in the hip-hop community and men. Um, and that was of a hardcore female. Um, and this persona, um, and I, 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 I encourage uh, those who have made reference to Boss and who have read that, that article, um, to listen to the entire Boss album to get a full understanding of the dimensions of that persona. Um, Boss, the character, um, as opposed to Lachelle, the individual, and, and, and we should note that characters in, in music, or uh, personas in music, are nothing, nothing unique to, to hip hop. Uh, I was thinking about, about other uh, artists like Cyndi Lauper, um, David Bowie when he when he adopted the Ziggy Stardust persona and to in many many respects um, Madonna um, for some reason I think we're comfortable um, distinguishing between the onstage or performance personas of those artists um, and their offstage private private personas in hip hop people have a little little more of a of a of a tough time doing that and I'm not quite sure sure why but if you listen to the entire album and get a full sense of of what this persona is um, you understand that this is a a a frustrated angry and frankly a little bit crazy um, person um, a member of the of the of the hardcore hip hop community um, she has uh, is very experienced sexually she has been involved with drugs the persona now not the individual, Lachelle Laws, um, and really paints um, a, a movie-like picture of the individual, the character, um, and the situations in which, in which she finds herself. Um, I think it's very important to understand, and, and in my statement, you recall, I, I, I made reference to um, the uh, inability of, of a number of listeners to accord hip hop artists credit for the kinds of uses of metaphor and imagery um, and other techniques that in other literary and artistic contexts um, are 
presumed, frankly, with respect to the artist, the artist concerned. Um, but when viewed in that context, um, Lish, the character Voss, uh, is 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 very real, um, and and that's that's the story. In, in the Wall Street article, in the Wall Street Journal article, Yo Yo, Boss seems to say that, and she, and I'm giving a direct quote now to the article. She says, "I'm a smart business person. I know what I'm doing, and I know how to make it in this business." Now, while there may be some authentic gangster rappers out there, is it? Do you believe that a large number of the people who do this are just smart business people that want to sell their music? I'm pretty sure you probably do have outsiders looking in saying, well, what's selling right now is rap. Rap is what they're listening to and rap is what, what's hot. Some young teens do feel like the only way out is rap out of the neighborhood, out of so, trying to survive. Yes, I do agree that some people feel like that. In all cases, that's not true. Would you, you say? You, you have true artists. Okay, go ahead. You have true artists, and you have artists who feel what they say. I'm a true artist. I feel what I say. I talk about different issues, issues that my mother might not agree with. I speak words that my mother may not agree with. I say things that maybe only the kids that I grew up with, the kids I go to school with, and the kids I hang out with might be able to understand. My mother might not be able to understand everything that I identify with, the way I dress, the way I do my hair, the lipstick I wear. But years ago, in my mother's generation, her mother couldn't understand. So, well, that's certainly true because I don't understand the things that my son did and my mother didn't understand the things that I did, but somewhere along the line, we had a, a meeting of the minds and, and I'm sure that that's gonna happen in, in all cases as, as each generation grows into an older generation. The question is that, uh, can you answer for me whether there are large numbers of people who get into this business simply to make the money or because they have a true feeling as you do about what you wanna say in your recordings? I couldn't answer that question direct because I don't know why each individual chose to become an entertainer in the music business, rap business. In the rap business? In the rap, I could not answer okay. the question why each individual chose to be a rapper. I chose to be a rapper because it was something that I felt like I wanted to get into. I was talented in all eras, as well as poetry, not only into creating a, a, a picture with I my music. Well, let me ask you this question. Uh, in the USA Today in October, uh, they had a, um, um, an article tall, called Talking Tough. Mm -hmm. And I know you've seen this already. And... Um, they're talking about the hip hop culture and female rappers go with the gangster flow. That's the entitlement of the article. But it says in here that Yo-Yo turns down her show if young kids are there. She feels the trend has gone too far and plans to change her image. And then it quotes you as saying, I'm so disappointed with the record companies. Now they're only looking for street rappers, no diversity. Is that a true statement? And why did you make the statement? In what context? Well, that statement might have been took out of context. I didn't say it like, like it's written up um, in the article. What I said was when I perform in front of kids, I do censor my rap. When I know there are kids in the audience, I tend to change up words mm -hmm. to, uh, because I know kids are out there listening to my music. My music has a sticker on it that says explicit lyrics on the cover of my music. When children do come out to hear my music, or it's a public event where everyone's coming out, or it's a free event, I tend to change up my music only for the safety of the kids because it's public, it's free, and the parents are with their kids, and I know that it's a kid event. That's like me going to Disneyland and are going out in the public speaking to, to kids and using profane words. I don't know how 12 year old kids are walking into stores and buying $17.99 tapes and CDs. I don't understand how it's happening. 
one of you testified, um, I don't have it right here, but it came out in the testimony who did it. I believe it was Mr. Singleton, and I put the testimony down, that um, talked about the labeling. Which one of you talked about the labeling requirements? Yeah, Mr. Singleton, you talked about the labeling requirements and about the parents. Um, uh, having met with the parents, the parents and this advisory that you have on here was something that was agreed to by the PTAs and others? Yes. Is that right? The PTA and the and, PMRC. And others, yeah. And there was something in the testimony that I pulled out and circle and then I mislaid it. Mislaid it. But uh, the point was that most of the time, as I understand it, when these uh, CDs and cassettes are being purchased, the parents aren't buying them. The kids are the ones who go to the record stores and buy them. And so even though there's a, an advisory on there, uh, the kids aren't likely to pay any attention to it. As a matter of fact, it would seem to me almost an incentive for a, a, an inquisitive kid to want to buy it to see what the thing says, rather than to place the burden on the, on the parent, which is where it should be, no doubt about that. It's where it should be, but I just wonder about how effective you think this advisory is and whether you think more can be done. You will recall the, the first panel said that mere labeling was not enough. Tell me what you think about that. Any I think, of you were sitting I think at the table. there's a need. I think there's a need for maybe more education if 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 the labeling is being ignored. I mean, education of the retailers and a lot of retailers are doing a lot about it. A lot of retailers already do things to separate the music and make it where they, they, some of them have rules where if you're not 18 or, or older, you can't buy the music. And in the in various communities, there are different uh, different postures that people take on. There's there's a if I may read it. There's a uh, a piece here that. Uh, the National Association of Recording Record Merchandisers, uh, which is a major organization of retailers uh, around the country in America. And in reference to that same thing, it, it makes reference here, and I'll just read a, a portion of this. It says, every store which tries hard to work with local communities find the message is mixed. Some stores which have implemented the 18 to buy policies at urging of the community find after a period of months that they receive as much feedback from parents who are angry that they had to accompany the teenager to buy a piece of music as they receive support from parents who were angry about a piece of music a teenager had bought um, unchaperoned. So that there are mixed feelings and there are mixed ways as to how various retailers are handling it. And to respond to what, what Don and, 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 and Dr. Uh, and Dr. Um, Tucker and Mr. Madison was referring to, I think that maybe there's a need, and, and, I, and I feel that these, these hearings are, are bringing that about as well, a need for more communication, more awareness, and if, if there are deficiencies in the system, let's identify what they are and find ways to adjust or correct that. Um, but, but more importantly, it, it, is, it is critical that we find ways to redefine upgrading our moral standards. I think we need to figure out, and Don Keneves made this reference, why are they saying what they're saying? There is anger, there is rage, there is some lack of communication, and, and, and it's not unusual for, for people that are in their early 20s to, to be defiant, to, to feel like they can rule and conquer all. It comes with youth. It comes with immature, with, with the inexperience of being a young adult as opposed to being a seasoned and experienced adult. And only, only after you've lived can you relate to the experienced adult. But there are, there are a lot of the young artists who are very mature. And if you listen to what they're saying and how they're saying it, they're very eloquent. They're very artful. They're, 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 their statements are, are very profound. Um, we've seen the harp on the fact that it's vulgar and it's obscene. They live in a vulgar and an obscene environment. Teen pregnancy, babies having babies is profane. That's vulgar. So we need to address, I think, some of the societal problems to correct the issue that our children are expressing, which emanates from the environment in which they live in. And I think it's also the reason why not just black kids, but white kids in record numbers buy the music, because they relate to this reality. It, and, and, you know, I think it was, um, um, I'm trying to call the, the gentleman's name who made the comment that, that rap music is the CNN of the inner cities. Chuck D. Chuck D. Chuck D. Yeah, Chuck D. Public Enemy. And it is that. Madam Chairwoman, can I uh, address this question? Sure. Okay. 
Uh, my problem with further regulation and further stickering of records uh, based on even an individual song is that uh, within any artist's repertoire, with any 12 songs, there may be one song that could be objectionable to someone. Public Enemy, which is a group that most people seem to hold up as a group that has strong messages, positive messages, even on their albums, they have been attacked on at least two of their albums for quote unquote misogyny on certain cuts. Now, if you check them and you label them that kids under 18 cannot buy a Public Enemy album because you're saying one cut may be misogynistic, then you're taking the other 11 songs that might talk about the Black Panthers as they've written about, or about Louis Farrakhan as they've written about, or about police mortality as they've written about, which are all valid artistic areas. And you're saying that a whole group of people who've already been turned on to the ideas of Public Enemy can no longer uh, have access to that material. So I, I'm just worried that when we get into this whole idea of stickering or additional stickering or restrictions, we're not just restricting uh, an overall area, we're restricting an artist who may have 10 messages on one album and one may be objectionable. That's what I'm very, it's more complex than saying, let's sticker and just restrict. I'm very concerned about that. Madam Chair, if I could Charleston. one additional comment, and that is, uh, in my view, um, labeling is really, or the current labeling practice, is really as effective as parents choose to make it. Now, I fully acknowledge the difficulty of raising children, particularly in urban America, young African-American children. Um, it is tough out there. But that difficulty does in no way diminish the responsibilities that attach to parenting. Um, it means having, I think, discussions with, with, with kids and families about what it is they're listening to and indeed why it is they're listening to. Um, I think not only does that give a parent greater insight into, into what's happening in their child's mind as that child is growing and, and developing, um, but also insight into the larger issues um, with which that parent may not be familiar, um, may not have as great an understanding as, as, as he or she could. Mr. Singleton, in your testimony, you state that MCA Records, Black Music Division, doesn't underestimate the significance and importance of its social responsibilities in your role as a good corporate citizen. The question is, is it socially responsible in good corporate citizenry to make millions of dollars off of the sexually explicit or graphically violent lyrics that's sometimes used in gangster rap? Either of you, or anybody at the table. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, in all fairness, I. Uh, I, I, I would defer passing that on to someone else. We do not have any gangster rap music on the MCA label. Mr. Harleston? Yeah. Um, the question, I think, presumes the kind of, of, of um, almost oversimplified analysis or, or de definition, rather, of, um, of, of gangster rap or of, of, of the issue, of the problem. Um, clearly, as a company, we feel a sense of social responsibility. We feel that responsibility to our community as African Americans, and we feel that responsibility to the very individuals who are raising the issues that we're discussing today. Um, in many respects, and I think some would even would acknowledge that that the, the purpose of what has been called gangster rap here today um, has been served because we are talking about it, and it is upsetting people. I don't think the response is making a lot of sense, because the response is, let's stop the expression or the definition or the articulation of the problem, um, rather than what I think it should be, which is, let's address the problem. Let's address the problems in education. Let's address the problems in unemployment. Let's address the problems um, that are plaguing and have plagued our, our community. Um, larger than that, is my view that this is not a debate or discussion over who owns the, the, the civil rights movement. Um, I think everyone at this table both understands um, and recognizes how we at this table have benefited from a profoundly important, perhaps the most profoundly important movement in this country. What's curious is that gangster rappers, as they've been characterized here today, are telling us that the work is not done. Gangster rappers, as they've been described here today, are telling us that we've got to keep moving because the demands that we imposed on this country and this government in the 1960s have not been met. 
And if we think that the struggle or the fight is over, we're kidding ourselves. And that message is profoundly important. So certainly, we feel a sense of social responsibility. We feel it to the community, which includes the very kids who are making us aware of what's going on in this music. Madam Chair, what I'd like to uh, just uh, slightly address again, since I'm the only sort of music critic here, address the question of musical uh, music and uh, art artistry. Um, I, for one, I mean, I found the Snoop Dogg album cover, for example, offensive. I, I, when I have the CD in my office, I have it flipped over so I see Snoop's face and not the cartoon. So there are obviously things that are objectionable. At the same time, out of gangster rap, in particular, uh, there's expressions of feelings, expressions of emotions that are very much in touch with the feelings of young America. Uh, I, I would cite, uh, for example, in the last year, there's been at least three to four, maybe even five videos that have been made by artists associated with gangster rap that have had funerals as a centerpiece of their videos. The reason they had funerals as a centerpiece of the videos is that the songs deal in violent imagery, but they're about the end product of that violence. Uh, Dead Homies uh, by Ice Cube is a prominent example of a song that talks about violence explicitly, talks about death in the young black community explicitly, but the context of that discussion is that it shows the endpoint of death and the kind of sadness which a lot of gangster rap reflects. A lot of this music talks about people who have gone, have passed, have died. Uh, there are other records that don't aren't necessarily gangster rap, such as uh, the record by um, Reminisce by uh, Reminisce by Seal Smooth, that also deals with the idea of of death, of loss. So. A lot of stuff that goes in the banner of gangster rap because it may even have curse words in it, it may have explicit lyrics about violence. The context of the discussion is about death itself and about the impact of death on the artist describing it. So again, I must say that when we discuss these records, we must make sure we're putting them in the proper context. The well, other branches of it, but the majority of the artists are from Los Angeles, and I think the reason gangster rap came out of Los Angeles has a lot to do with the particular conditions of that city. The gang culture there has been there for 20 years or so. It is much more intense. The idea of the drive-by shooting, which has become part of our lexicon in this country, is something that is foreign to New York, foreign to Philadelphia, foreign to DC. Uh, it's very much a product of that environment. So part of this discussion of gangster rap also has to focus in on the particulars of Los Angeles, California, South Central. I think even Yo-Yo could maybe even address that a little bit, because we talked about that earlier. Yeah, I was saying, uh, being from Los Angeles and going over to the East Coast, there is a difference. There's more, they're more culturally motivated than the West Coast, I feel. I feel the West Coast are so involved with gangs, drugs. It's like they're locked into a, a cave. It's like they're shelled in. You know when you're in the neighborhood of, of, of the, um, the young gangbangers are just the black neighborhood. You know when you're in the hood and you know when you're out of the hood. And it's like that in, in everywhere you go. I think that West Coast rappers tend to be more, more hardcore, which you would call it, because reality of Los Angeles or the West Coast is so hard. We can't run from the problem that surround us. If we, if we talk about the situations that may be uh, detrimental to someone's ears, they may feel, or may be harmful to a child, you may feel, it is reality. And kids are listening to it because they see it, and they don't see it from your eyes like you see it. They see it from looking at it. They see it from across the street. They see it from their mother using drugs. They see it from bums laying on the corner. They see it from the tore up neighborhoods and drive by shootings. So it's not as harsh as you make it seem. It's reality for us. It's these words are not as intimidating to me as they are to you. Although I am a feminist and although I will not and will never let anyone call me a bitch or a hoe. I am not offended when the word is used because it has become a slang word in the neighborhood that is not as intimidating as my mother may take it or someone else may take it. 
Madam Chairwoman, can I continue on? I want to continue to put this in the context, because I think Please. we haven't really done that totally. Gangster rap, as we know it, as a genre of music, really has its roots in the mid-'80s. Uh, there's a couple of artists you might cite, particularly Ice-T, who made records in independent labels in the mid-'80s, as well as KRS-One had an album called Criminal Minded that came out in 87, I believe, which also was one of the first to deal with the drug culture. One of the things that's very clear about the evolution of this music is that it got more intense, rap music got more intense, more violent, when crack cocaine became one of the leading cause, forces of economics in the black community. You can almost look at the indice of gangster rap being created, particularly 89, 88, when uh, NWA broke through, which was the really first superstar gangster rap group that Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, etc., came out of. They're, they're, much of their material deals with crack cocaine, especially that period. Uh, the amount of violence in the black community, in cities like DC, for example, New York City, LA, all escalated with the introduction of crack cocaine. The gangs that had so often uh, been in LA for years and years in the black community became much more dangerous, much more violent, in fact, became national concerns in the sense when crack cocaine became this viable tool for expansion of their criminal enterprises. The gangster rappers know it is very much a reflection of this new environment that was created by crack cocaine. Um, and this is, you can look at it, gangster rappers, we describe it, it's been discussed from like 80, 88 to 89 to now. Before that, there were always some records that dealt with violence. There were records like The Message from 84 by Grandmaster Flash that dealt with social reality. But the intensity of, of, of violence and rap music is directly related to the intensity of violence in the black community. And, and you can see it record by record. I can make, if I had the time, I could make a chart that would show you exactly the amount of violence, the incarceration of young black men, uh, and the degree, a number of, of gangster rap records that began being created. That, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. You said if you had time, you could do that. I would like to ask you to make such a chart and send it to the subcommittee because I'd like to see the correlations that you have there. I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll work on it uh, when I get back to New York. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of stuck on this, this question, so I'm, I'm going to keep on asking it for a little bit anyway. Mr. Singleton, you, you state that the morals and ethics of our society are diminishing and that we have to look at societal problems like welfare, dependence, and something by the way that Congress is doing right now. And you further state that societal disintegration uh, starts with factors like these and not with music. But now the question is, are you seriously suggesting that the vulgar lyrics in gangster rap, or whatever you want to call it, plays no part at all in the further disintegration of morals and ethics in our society. And somebody in the first panel mentioned, you know, whether we were talking about a chicken eggs approach. What is your response to that? I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't have any bearings on the problems in our society, but it appears as though a finger is being pointed at rap music as being the problem when we're seeing more of the effects of a much broader problem. Um, it's almost like in the days of segregation. I didn't agree with the fact that we had to drink from the colored only water fountains, uh, but that wasn't the problem. That was a little bit of a much bigger problem. When Rosa Parks had to sit in the back of the bus, I'm sure she didn't agree with that, as none of us agreed with it. In fact, it, did, it didn't matter to me today whether I sit in the back of the bus or not. But just don't make me move once I sit down. But that wasn't the problem of where we sat. It was, the, it was a more, more a symptom of a much bigger problem. All I'm saying, Congresswoman, is that there is a much bigger problem, and rap is being made the scapegoat of something that is, is much, much broader than the rap and the rap artist. In, 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 in a spirit of fairness, the, the record industry and the record company is being blamed and pointed fingers at for something that our children created. Major record companies didn't create this music. Major record companies and retailers of Did America- Did they exploit it? They didn't exploit it either, Madam Chairwoman. Major record companies and major retailers were avoiding this music for a long time. This music took over a major, major share of the marketplace. And again, I sit here before you. Uh, it was an honor because you, you because uh, because you asked. Uh, as it's an honor to have so many representatives, African American representatives in Congress, it, there is no Congress person that would ask me to do anything that I wouldn't do in terms of moral responsibility and our and our commitment of what we need to do. Whether I was working for MCA or working for no one, I would be here because because I understand the call and I understand the the, the need to address the issue. But the the point I'm trying to make here is that we're we, we if we're going to point fingers. 
we really need to stop, and, and hopefully, if nothing else happens, as I said earlier, let's identify the real problems. Let's not put a Band-Aid on what appears to be broke. The, the problem is much bigger than, and, and everybody here is saying it, and even the people who spoke before the, the other panels spoke, they made the same references in terms of what's going on in our inner cities. It is not an easy problem to solve. I, I can't sit here and, and, and act like I am so intelligent as to what goes on in Congress and in government to legislate and tell you, Congresswoman, or the, or, or the Senate or the government how to correct these problems. All I'm saying is, please don't point fingers at we, we go out of our way to, to make our artists be community sensitive. One of the first things I'll tell an artist when we're signing is, if you're not going to give back to the community, we're not even interested. We're not even interested. It is, it is imperative that artists understand that they've got to give back to the community, that it is so important that, that our, our children are given hope, our education system seems to be failed. So yes, I am saying a lot of things. I, we have a welfare system that, that promotes that a woman be, that, 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 that there's no man in the household for a woman to be on welfare. So it's, it's encouraging a family to be raised, whether it's a boyfriend or, or, or whatever kind of uh, a spouse that's living with the woman. A woman, women are encouraged to not have a man present. So the children, therefore, does not have the manly figure there to be raised. I'm number nine of 13 children. My mother and father fathered all 13 of us. I don't relate to that, to that world. Of, of children being born and raised without both parents being present or without parental direction and guidance. But again, we have an inadequate system in our welfare system that, that opens the door. We talked about the, the crack problems that exist. What about the crack mothers and the crack fathers of the last 15 or 20 years? And where, and where are their children? And, and, and what are they doing? What they, so some of our problems are much, much, much bigger than any song you hear from Tupac Shakur or Snoop Doggy Dog, the, the graphicness of the lyrics and the, and the graphicness of the packaging is a byproduct of something much bigger that isn't going to go away. And, and I have a lot at stake here. I have three children. I, I, I've learned, I've grown in this music through my children. I have a 16-year-old honor student who's very athletic in sports. Uh, he, I have a 22-year-old daughter at Xavier University in New Orleans and a 23-year-old son at Southern University in, in New Orleans. I have a lot at stake, as we all do, but my children, Congresswoman, are also your children. And when we as a society begin to accept each other's children and not shun the responsibility of one another's children, whatever affects, when, when, when I see people concerned about going into a parking lot because of, a, because of somebody taking their car or, or, or whatever the, the term is, a car banging, and, 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 and that concerns me. That affects my community as well. I mean, these problems are so broad-based. They affect our real estate. They affect our inner city communities. They affect our economic uh, base. Uh, I think uh, Congresswoman uh, Waters is, is, a, is a prime example that I see as a, as a role model that I know. She's one of the few politicians, and this is nothing against any other politicians, but she's one of the few politicians that I know the rap community adores and respects because she gets in the trenches with them. She, she, there's a sensitivity level there or a relatability that I think brings about a, a trust that you know, I love Jesse, and I, 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 and I, and I, so many rappers I love, and I hear different things. It is important that we, those of us who are leaders, begin to have dialogue with the yo-yos of the world, or the ice teas, or the ice cubes, and let's try to figure out what is wrong. Why are they saying what they're saying? Senator, uh, I'd like to add something else. Uh, um, I think one of the things that wasn't done early that we need to do is discuss the difference between what MCA Records is and what Def Jam Records is in relation to the overall development of rap music. That is, the rap music from its earliest roots in New York City in the 19 and early 80s was a music that was made by independent labels, put out by independent labels, mostly initially black-owned. Uh, Enjoy Records, owned by a gentleman named Bobby Robinson, has a record store on 125th Street. Sylvia Robinson, uh, who was a recording artist, mm -hmm. at a, uh, called Sugar Hill Lit Records out of New Jersey. For most of rap's history, up until, I'd say, 1987, 1987 or so, rap music was totally an independent product. Uh, Tommy Boy Records, Profile Records, etc. These are all independent entities that are not involved with major corporate structures. Uh, in 1987 or so, I believe, uh, Russell Simmons and Def Jam made a deal with CBS Records for distribution, then CBS, now Sony. Uh, in the wake of that deal, a number of other independent labels, such as Tommy Boy, I believe, Cold Chilling, these are all independent labels, made deals for distri distribution of the product. But the actual product itself came through independent labels. To this day, 
now in 1994. Def Jam basically is an autonomous organization that makes the records it wants to make. Tommy Boy does likewise, and they have a deal with Warner Brothers. These independently owned companies are basically the, the lifeblood of rap music. The major labels only in the last few years have actually signed rap artists directly to their labels. Uh, to this day, in fact, a lot of the records that, we're, you're, that are being uh, objected about, such as the uh, things made by the Two Live Crew, uh, records made by Ice Cube, Ice T, uh, Now, um, most of NWA's product was through independent labels. These are labels that are not affiliated with major uh, corporations. Many of these labels are owned by black entrepreneurs and black businessmen. I just don't want anyone to get the feeling that there's a uh, I get this, this subtext that there's a cabal of rich white men sitting in big towers on 6th Avenue who are deciding that we should put these records out. That is not how rap music works. Rap music works because independent entrepreneurs, mostly black, make these records for an audience mostly black that now the music has sort of crossed over to whites to some degree. But it is still very much a black created, black directed, black targeted product. Uh, even at our Ernie's label, Uptown Records is owned by a young man named Andre Harrell, who's totally an ex-rapper himself, and now has his own rap label. Heavy D is one of his artists, who is distributed by MCA, but Andre is fully aware and control of the product that comes out through that label. So I just want to put it in context that this music is very much a product of our community, very much a product of our young business community. Uh, and I guess the subset of that discussion is that in the last 10 years, I, I started in the record business as a writer in 19, really 1981, my first real job. Uh, I am a product of rap music in the sense that my career as a writer has been elevated and informed by the development of this music. I can parallel my career and my development as a writer by my ability to write about rap music at, at a point when no one wanted to write about it back 10 years ago or so. Uh, and most of the people I know who are my friends, including Russell Simmons and Andre Harrell, et cetera, were all young men in New York City in the early, late 70s, early 80s, trying to find a way into a business. And rap music has funneled out, and we have done well, and people coming up behind us have done well. There's an industry that would, did not exist prior to rap music's creation that was a point of entry into a business that was locked out for young black people. There are so many. Uh, black college graduates. There's so many 25 to 30 year old young black men and women who are employed in the record industry in a wide range of activities because of this music. So I, I just think we need to understand the role of rap music both as a, a economic force within the black community, was an employment source, and as a cultural source, which we've discussed mostly. Rap is a multifaceted environment, and gangster rap, as we know it, is what one factor in an overall tapestry of music. So let's put that in context. Thank you very much. I'd like to add, if I can. You may indeed. There are many forms of rap music. There is not just gangster rap, hardcore rap. There are many forms of rap. Fresh Prince of Bel Air is a rapper, an artist now on a, um, TV, you know, with this, uh, what's the name of his show? Uh, Fresh, Prince, yeah, Fresh, Prince. Uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I wonder why does the bad images are the images that we say or you say, not me, you say are bad images so popular? Why is Snoop Doggy Dog going out in a day and selling three million albums? Why are those just the ones that you point the finger at? Tupac. These guys are selling millions of albums. These, they're the request. People are not going out on the street corners passing these tapes out saying they're free. People are going into stores and purchasing these tapes. People want to hear this music. I don't understand how the discussion becomes so, I mean, I understand how the discussion becomes so big because parents are now paying attention to what their kids are listening to and wondering why they are listening to this music. But you have to take a look around and take a look at what these kids feel 
they go out and buy the music because they feel for this type of music. If I don't feel, I don't feel for rock and roll and I don't go purchase rock and roll. I don't feel for certain type of music and I don't purchase certain music. If, mu if certain music offend me, I don't purchase it, I don't listen to it, and if I choose not to buy it, that's my choice. People go out and they purchase this music. They choose to listen to this music. How can you say, I don't want you to listen to that music when they choose to listen to this music? I think parents need to start discipline, discipline their children, being more involved in home activities. There's too many single parents. There's not enough home morals for these kids. And that's why you have so many 12-year-old listening to rap tapes. If your child can get a hold to a rap tape, then he can get a hold to a porno movie. He can turn on HBO and see what he wants. He can get a, a hold to Playboy magazine. It's not just rap. And when you attack rap, you need to attack every situation because rap is not the key factor here. There and the is, lyrics are not the key factors here. In, in, in this Congress, there is a tremendous discussion going on now. You mentioned that it's not just rap, that when they turn on television, there is violence and et cetera. And there is a tremendous discussion going on in this committee, not in this subcommittee, but in this committee of energy and commerce about the violence that's in television and cable that is, that is going on right now. The Congress has a responsibility when there are tremendous issues that are out in, in, the, in the public to take a look at those issues. Uh, I said in my opening statement that I'm not about doing anything about First Amendment rights. I don't believe you can legislate morality. I think it's something that has to come from within, wherever it comes from within, the home, the church, wherever it is, but it has to come from within. If there's anything at all we hope to do is to raise the consciousness of morality. Now, so far as the music is concerned, there is nothing that I see wrong with, quote, the music the music per se, with the beat. The problem that many people have, and which is part of the subject of this hearing, the lyrics that are there that are offensive to many people. Now, whether or not you who are in the industry find it who offensive. Who are they offending? Who's listening to it? Who's putting the tape in the tape cassette and listening to it? Who? The children are, but the parents are the ones who are beginning to complain. And that's why we have to speak, we, we have to find out what's going on here. There's a whole, in, a whole industry that's talking ab about these matters. And these are matters that come before everybody. So it has to be looked at from every point of view that's involved here. Well, so the matter, the mere fact that the industry, of course, is going to say well, we're doing nothing wrong. I'm not here to choose whether you're right or wrong. Frankly, I don't really see the difference. As long as a parent wants his child to listen to this music, that's the parent's responsibility. As long as a parent gives a child X number of dollars for allowance and that child can spend that money any way he wants to, that's okay by me. But it's those large numbers of parents who say, we don't want our, child, our children hearing this. We don't want our children watching television and seeing all these kinds of things. We want better labeling. Well, why we want certain things taken off. Those are the things that come before government. Now, I'm not one to talk about labeling. In any real sense, I asked a question because I wanted to know, is this label sufficient? What do you think about it? You who are in the industry, I'm trying to get your information. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is adequate or don't you think it's adequate? One member of your industry has said it's not adequate. Another has said it's not adequate. That there are other things that could be done. Someone suggested on the first panel you might put an X on there the way you do in movies. That can be done. Somebody mentioned something about the FCC. There are all kinds of remedies and one remedy is to do nothing. We all understand that, but we are about the business of finding out what is going on. Somebody mentioned about our children and about how everybody is involved in rearing children. Well, we all know the old African uh, statement that it takes everybody in the village to raise a child, and I believe that. But we are about the business of finding out what's going on here. Yeah. We aren't about the business of criticizing overly anybody for what do they do. Everybody has a right to make a living, but we also have a right to know what they're doing, and that's what we're trying to find out here, and that's what we're going to find out here. Now, Mr. George, you said that one, uh, on the one hand, you point out that gangster rap polarized the use of guns. And then on the other hand, they seem to suggest that these rappers have no influence on our children.